Well, if you have your Bible with you, I'm going to ask you to turn with me this morning. Turn with me to 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 13. As you do that, here you got to remember turning the TVs on back there. I like looking at them. <laughs> As you turn there, I want you also to turn to somebody close to you and say, I love you. sermon this morning, one word, and it's charity, one word. That word charity in our scripture today means love. It means agape love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. That kind of love. Throughout scripture, this is further to understood that it's talking about a divine love. That which is embodied in Christ and only possible for those who through faith by grace are in Christ and living his love. In 1 John 4, 8 says, God is the very definition of love. So the more we get to know God, the more we understand love. And the man God, Jesus, the second being of the Trinity, also personifies love. If you want a role model in love, you have only to look to Jesus Christ. Christ's mission was a mission of love. Everything that Christ did during his earthly ministry was driven by agape love. He was the love that moved God again to send his son to the cross on our behalf to pay for our sins. There is no question what the world needs more than anything else is love. If people love each other, really love each other, there would be no more wars or crime or abuse, injustice, poverty, hunger, starvation, homelessness, depression, uh, immorality. All, all this stuff will be covered and taken care of with love. You see, love is the one ingredient that could revolutionize society. And boy, our society needs to be revolutionized. I mean, we're living in such wicked times and perilous times. I mean, you could just be standing on the street now and somebody just walk up and sucker punch you. We, we're seeing all this. This week, a lady walking down the street, walking home from work. Somebody walks up, shoots her in the head. Her life is gone just like that. We're living in a mean, evil, corrupt world. And if there's something desperately that we need, it is love. And I want you to understand, as we call ourselves Christians, the Christian faith is all about being consumed and smothered in love. Mm. Now, I want you to understand, this is some powerful message here this morning to you and I. Really powerful. And I just want to say this, in the, in the eyes of God, I don't want to be a nobody. I don't want to be somebody who accomplishes nothing. And I don't want to be somebody that profits nothing. But you know what the scripture tells me here this morning? That if I do not have the love of God, then everything I do and everything I am is nothing. Nothing. Follow with me in the scriptures. We're going to read verses 1 through 13. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, and have no charity, have no love, I become a sounding brass or tingling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have no charity, have no love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have no charity, have no love, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. 
Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed out, doeth not behave itself unseemly, seeth not her own, seeketh not her own, excuse me. It is not easily provoked, thinking no evil, rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth, bearing all things, believing all things, hope all things, endure all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecy, there shall be there shall fall or fail. Whether there be tongues, there shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I speak as a child and I understand as a child. I thought as a child. But when I become a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through, through, through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abide faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for the day, and I thank you for your blessings. Father, I thank you that when we come to you, Lord, surrender our lives, our hearts to you, Father God, it is the love of God that comes within us. And Father, if we're not overflowing with the love of God, dear God, something's wrong in, in our lives if we call ourselves Christians. God, I want to be a somebody, and I want to profit, Lord, and I want to profit in the things of God. But the Bible tells me if I do all sorts of things in the name of God and for God, but I do it not in love and have no love, then it's absolutely nothing. God, I thank you for the cross where it shows your love, and I pray, God, that through my life I will demonstrate the love of God to others, and that I will love you with all my heart with all my soul, with all my mind, all my understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My first point, without charity, verses 1 through 3, it simply says, I am nothing. You see, one of the problems in the church at Corinth was that they were manifesting nearly every spiritual gift that exists, but they were not walking in love one for another. The Corinthians loved the flesh and the gifts. They, they loved tongues and prophecy and the gifts that made them feel real special, uh, special in one another's eyes. But God's more interested in, uh, in us coming into a place where the, that we love more one another like he loves us. Of all the talents that we've got, all that we can do, God is more interested in us loving one another. God is more interested in us loving him. God is more interested in us loving the lost. You serious preacher, I'm supposed to love the lost? The Bible says love your enemies. Isn't that what it says? Love. Everything in the believer's life ought to be prompted by and, and, and just pushed by that word love, agape love, love for God, love for others, love for the lost. You see, the church at Corinth had a lot of problems. They had a lot of theology divisions and blatant sin. They had class divisions. They had little cliques here and there all in the church. And so they, they were really full of pride and pride is a root of a lot of evil and sin. Right. Pride. But what was failing, what they were lacking, was what everybody needs in every church, and that's love. So the whole idea of these verses is to, uh, that love is distinct from and superior to anything else that we can do is love. Amen. I love people who love, don't you? Amen. I love people. You get around people, they're always loving, they're always kind, and we're going to get into that more, but... I like being around people like that. Regardless of what we do, if it is not infused with and carried through uh, the love of God, it is a colossal waste of time. And I'm just telling you what Scripture says. This ain't my opinion.
opinion. This ain't what I think. This is what God says. If we're doing anything, it must be under the umbrella of love. Amen. Amen? You may be a great speaker, but that is no substitute for love. No matter how great or how beautiful your speech may be without love, you're simply a clinging symbol according to the scriptures here. Have you ever been to a symbol solo? No. Um, you've never been to one, have you? No. No. You've been to piano rehearsals and all that stuff, but not a symbol. You see, a symbol isn't any good. It isn't any good at all if it's not in a band, if it's not in an orchestra. A sounding symbol is, is about useless. It's a gong. Don't get a lot out of that. And the Bible says that if we don't have the love of God in us, that's what we're like. We're, we're actually doing nothing. We're getting nothing. Nothing's happening. We're profiting nothing. Nobody's going to go to a symbol concert. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be around us, but there's no love. Hmm? Love. No matter what you say, nor how you say it, nor how accurate it might be, without love, it's just noise. Without love, talk, uh, uh, talk, uh, talk truly is cheap. You see, a person can uh, profess the, the gift or possess the gift and ability to speak and share Christ with all kinds of languages. You may speak multiple tongues, but I'm going to tell you something. You're not much good to God if you don't have love in your heart. Your speech is meaningless. Verse 2 mentions several spectacular abilities. But even if a person was able to do all these things, he or she cannot, and does not have the love of God in their heart, then they're, they're nothing. That's what the Bible says, not me. And I don't know about you, but when God looks at me, I want him to see something, not nothing. And when he looks at me, he's looking for love. He's looking for love in my heart. Amen? And that's what he's looking at when he looks at you. He wants to first see love. It all has to come under the umbrella of love. Why do you do things? Love. There's a lot of people, a lot of things happen in church, a lot of things happen today, and people do it because they're hoping that somebody will notice. And they get a pet on the back. Say amen. That's the truth. But I want to tell you something. If you didn't do it because you love Jesus, if you didn't do it because you love God, you didn't do it because you love the people, you didn't teach Sunday school because you love the children, then it's just like sounding simple. Song. Just notice. And note the crucial point here. The gift, the gifted person, the person's gift, not, not only the, is meaningless, but the person themselves is meaningless. A person may have the gift of speaking under the inspiration of God's Spirit, both predicting in the future and proclaiming the truth of the Word of God. He, he, he may possess all the charisma and all the eloquence and descriptive language in the world, but if they're, they're, they're doing it for, for themselves and not out of the love of God and the love of people, then Jesus says, the Bible says, it's nothing. It's nothing. Not only is the prophecy nothing, but he's nothing. He becomes useless in his life and ministry for Christ's love is far more superior than anything we can do. The greatest thing we can do, listen to me, child of God, the greatest thing you can do today is love that person beside of you. Love that person behind you. Love that person in front of you. And most of all, love Jesus Christ with all your heart. Amen? Amen. Who? Love Jesus. Love is one. Love is not just one Christian virtue among many. It is the essence of what it is to be a follower of Christ. If you have that, you have everything. If you don't, you have nothing. It's really that simple. 
Verse 3, it says, I profit nothing. Giving without love profits nothing. Paul is not saying that our works will lose some of their value if not done in love. He, he is not just saying that acting in love is the best way to live out our faith as we serve God. No, he, he's saying that without love, nothing we do for Christ means anything. Profits nothing. It might benefit others, but the one doing the serving, doing the giving, doing the sacrifice, it has no value if we don't do it for the right reason. And that is loving, 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 loving. If we don't do it for loving, it's almost a wasted effort. And I give credit for that. God is not impressed. You won't get credit for things that you do outside of love. Love. I hope you're here today because you love Jesus. Amen. 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 I hope you're inspired to do it because you love Jesus. I hope you'll get involved in the things of the church because you love Jesus. I hope you'll do something to help us out at the fall festival because you love Jesus, you love the lost, you love your brothers and sisters in Christ, and you're going to do something to show your love. Mm. Oh, goodness. As I read these verses, I'm forced to recognize that anything which was done for the reason other than love was, a, in fact, something at all. In God's sight, it was nothing. That's sobering. It's sobering to think that, that some of what I, I've done, uh, of my giving, might have been absolutely nothing because I didn't do it for the right reason, in the right attitude, in the right purpose. Perhaps you look back on your life and can identify times when you've given or you've served or you've labored or you've sacrificed or you've suffered for Christ. And hopefully you can look back and see some times you did. And you're wondering now, though, that, did I do it out of love for God and love for people? Or else was it for other reasons? Perhaps you're engaged in a ministry even now and you're, you're thinking about uh, these verses and wondering, am I doing this out of love? Am I teaching? Am I caring for the children in the nursery or, or leading a Bible study or tithing or giving up my time out of love? The more I study this, this, this chapter, the more I study these verses, I'm thinking, man, you know, we have to plead with people to do things a lot of times and and then if they're not doing it for the right reason, then why should we plead with them? Because according to God, it amounts to nothing. Because they're not doing it for the right reason. I'm convinced in my heart that we get a church people full of people that's loving Jesus and loving one another. We won't have problems getting people to show that love right. in doing. Mm. When Paul was telling us in chapter 13, well, what Paul is telling us here is that factor which determines the quality of our work. You see, the key factor which determines whether it has value, whether it will last or will be burnt up as it had been never happened, is love. <laughs> to put it another way, it doesn't just matter what we do, it matters why. It matters. Regardless of what others may think of us, our abilities, our gifts, our, without love, it is all a spectacular waste of time. And we profit nothing. Free love should be at the forefront of everything that you and I do. Love should be at the forefront of everything we do. We can give away everything we own. We can even give up our bodies on the altar of martyrdom. But if we don't do so without love in our hearts, it is a waste of time and it profits us not one thing. Again, that's what Paul is saying. That's what the scripture is saying here in chapter 13. That's not your preacher talking. 
If we are to exercise our spiritual gifts and Holy Spirit empowered to the glory of Christ and the fullness of his purpose, then it must be exercised in divine love for Jesus. The greatest and most essential gift that God has given the church is the gift that contains that divine power. It is the gift of love. When people come into that door church, we ought to be loving them. Amen? Amen. We want them to feel that love. We don't want to feel no cold shoulder. When they come in that door, we may not, ought to make a special effort to welcome them and love them. And we need to do that to one another as we see each other come up on this hill to worship God. We ought to show that love to one another. Amen? Amen? Mm. The greatest gift we have is the gift of love working in us and through us. His love working in us and displayed one to another is the greatest testimony we have to a lost world. Verses 4 through 7 here, we see the wealth of charity. We see the wealth of love here in verses 4 through 7. You see, it reveals, or it reveals it, 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 its character, or characteristics here. You see, I, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I'm going to hit these, all these little you know, uh, words here real quick. But the first one is suffer long. That word means to patient endurance under provocation. Literally meaning to, uh, uh, the word is long temper. This characteristic is that love reveals the, the truth that love does not retaliate. Boy, as Christians, we should never have that kind of attitude. Amen? Well, I don't know how you just wait out here. One of Abraham Lincoln's most outspoken political enemies was a man named Edwin Stanton. And Stanton called Lincoln a low, cunning clown. He even called him the original gorilla. He called Abraham Lincoln a gorilla. He ridiculed him and told people, so you don't have to go to Africa to see a gorilla, just come to Springfield, Illinois. To Lincoln's credit, he never responded to those insults, yet when he was elected president of the United States, he chose this man to be secretary of war. And so I said, why? This was your biggest critic. He said, because he's the best man for the job. And later, when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, there stood Edward Stanton standing at his grave with tears rolling down his eyes. And he said, there lies the greatest ruler man has ever seen on this world. Patience, love. Patient love in action won that man over the, over the course of time. Next thing is kind there. This word refers to active goodness and, and goes for, uh, forth in behalf of others. It, it is courageous. It is good. It is helpful. It is useful. It is giving. It is showing and showering favor. Especially means act of benevolence. Rather than retaliating with wrong Christian love chooses to respond with graciousness and goodness. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Because God was kind to you and I. You and I, us sinners, and wanted us to have everlasting life. He was kind to us, and he gave his son that we could have everlasting life. We've got to match that kindness with our lives as much as possible. The Bible says, envy if not. You see, the wealth of treasure here is that we envy if not. That true love is not jealous over the abilities and excess and the possessions of other people. We should never be jealous. And, and when, they, when they win an award, when they do something great, we ought to joy with them. We ought to have a glad heart with them. Amen. You see, it was jealousy that put Jesus on the cross. It was jealousy that caused Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. It was jealousy that put Daniel in the lion's den. It was jealousy that put Joseph in the pit. Love shares and joys and rejoices in the experience and good of others. Godly love is never jealous. Love, love, love. It boils not itself. Literally, this means does not make a parade. Love does not brag. It, it, you know some of those people? You ever been around somebody, no matter what you've done, they've done it bigger and better? Hey. <laughs> I think we all have. 
Yeah, I, I was at a place one time, and this guy said, watch this. I said, I hadn't done this, but I'm going to let's see what his response. And he told this great thing he'd done that, and he, sure enough, that guy topped it off. He'd done better, same thing, but better. He said, I didn't do that, but I knew he would come back saying he'd done it better. <laughs> There's people like that. Vomit on itself. You know, an, an admired uh, orchestra, Leonard Bernstein, Bernstein, excuse me, he was a celebrated orchestra conductor, and he was asked one time, said, what's the hardest instrument to play? You know what his reply was? Without hesitation, he said, second fiddle. I can always find plenty to play first violinist, but to find one who will play second violin, find one that is enthused about playing second French horn or the second flute, that's a problem. And without somebody being second, there is no harmony. Everybody can't be first, amen? amen. Love, one of the wonderful things about love is not puffed up. Love is not arrogant or proud, does not think nor act as though oneself is better or above others. Love is modest and humble. You know, we talked about trials this morning. You know what trials do in Sunday school? We talked about that. You know what a lot of trials do? It'll humble you. It'll bring you to your knees and realize you, and you'll realize you need God. And not only that, you need brothers and sisters in Christ to pray for you and uplift you and encourage you. You need others. Amen? Amen. Love does not behave itself unseemingly. In other, in other words, it's not rude. It's rude. How can you be a confessing Christian and act rude to people and expect to win anybody to Christ? You see, love controls the emotions. It is not friendly one day and rude the next. That's not a Christian. Love seeth not it her own, or seeketh not her own. Now, you know, true love is never selfish or self-centered, but it is actively interested in what will profit other people. What's best for others? Mm. You know, one of the hardest things in the world is getting one of those, you know, one of those church financial meetings, or, uh, you know, call, uh, meetings, and, 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 and everybody thinks they're right. And so nothing gets done. Everybody's wanting green carpet, or half of them's wanting green carpet, and the other half wanting red carpet. Just give up. Let, let, let's go. What matters is the carpet. Amen. We argue about a lot of things that don't matter because they know this is going to heaven with us. Amen? That's right. Amen. 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 Not easily provoked. The characteristic of love reminds us that love does not demand its own rights. Hmm. Think of no evil. Love takes no worthless inventory. You see, love suffers the evil done to it and, and forgets it. Two thoughts are in mind here. You know, genuine love does not dwell on, on what others may have done to you in, in, in its attitude where, uh, you know, is that, you know, I'm going to forgive, I'm going to forget, I'm going to move on. That would solve a lot of problems, wouldn't it? Love, its wealth, it rejoices in the truth. You see, rejoices when truth is known and when it, it prevails and rejoices when others are recognized and promoted for whom they are and for what they have contributed. While love hates all form of evil, it loves the truth. It rejoices when truth is proclaimed and when truth wins the victory. Love bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things. That word bear means to both to cover all things and to bear up under all things. You see, love patiently endures and uh, overlooks the faults in others. That's the only way we can get along is overlook the faults in one another. We all have faults, don't we? Amen. Yeah? Say amen right there. Amen. Oh, some of y'all, come on. you got faults. <laughs> some of you men, let me ask your wife. They'll tell you me right quick. Amen. <laughs> You got faults. <laughs> you 
We all do. We just overlook them. We love each other. And we move on, right? That's right. Love always expects the best. In other words, a possible outcome, and that's hope. Love refuses to accept failure. Love is the eternal optimist. Love always holds hope that all will work out right in the end. And, and it endures. That word endure is the military word meaning to stand against the, the attacks of the enemy. Love actively fights and endures all attacks. And it conquers and triumphs always because it endures all things. Love. Now, verses 8 through 13, my next sub-point. It is eternal. Love is eternal. You see, love is so far superior to our gifts, to anything we can do. Here's why the message of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is so powerful. It was powerful to the people of Corinth who was so obsessed with class and wealth and influence and reputation. And it's equally powerful for us, for you and I, because in order to love, to truly love one another as Christ loved us, to love sacrificially and authentically and joyfully, we, we have to keep in mind that the most of the things that cause division among us, that make us envious and proud, that create a mentality of us against them, most of those things don't matter. They just don't matter. They won't last is the reason they don't matter. They're temporal, like your breath on a cold winter's morning. And when everything else in this world has passed away, when everything that is held by us with such high esteem is gone, when knowledge and spiritual gifts no longer matter, love will still exist. It is the greatest constant throughout eternity, love. What are you talking about, preacher? Love is the only thing that we can cross over with. Love for Jesus, love for others. Jesus loving us, love, love, love. I'm going to tell you, heaven's stream will be in love flowing. Love. Amen. And everything we have and everything we see here, it will be gone. It won't matter. Will it? The things we have and experience here feel like all there is to have and experience right now, but they're not. You see, compared to our real life, the life that we will live in eternity with Christ, everything we'll experience here from the cradle to the grave is less than a breath. It will be gone, less than the blink of an eye. And when we find ourselves standing on the other side, none of these things will matter. They will be gone and discarded in the grave. And I, and I could go on and on, but fame and power and prestige and reputation, none of these things will last past the grave. Amen? Right. Amen. None of them will persist into eternity. What will, what will matter is how, how we treat one another, where we have love for one another in our hearts, and where we love God, and where we demonstrate that love for one another and that love for God. Everything else. Is details. Everything else will be swept away. What makes love so great? Well, love is defined. Love is the defining character of who God is. Well, you see, it says in 1 John 4 8, what? God is love. God is love. Mm. We are never more like God. Than we learned than when we learn to love like God. To be like God, we must learn to love like Him. And when we can do this, our world will be altered for His glory. Do you get that? You see, all this love stuff that I'm talking about is all about for His glory. I won't tell you something. When you love one another, the devil don't like it. When you love Jesus, the devil don't like it. But when you love one another, you love the Lord, I'm telling you what, all that's for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. And it's a kick in the face to the old Satan. Amen. When you love one another. Amen. Brother Rodney, he don't want me and you to get along, Satan. 
He wants me and you to be at odds with one another. But you know what, brother Rodney? I'm going to love you. I don't care what you do. I'm going to love you. You hear me, boy? I'm going to love you. Sister Bird, I'm going to love you. I'm going to always love you. Who don't love that woman? Amen? You see, love triumphs every spiritual gift. Love tops every miracle God may work through you. Love proceeds every course of action you may take. Love stands above everything else. That's what Paul is telling us. That's what Paul was trying to drive home to this Corinthian church. It's love. It's all about love and nothing less than love. And long as we got love, we can defeat Satan and we can conquer anything that comes to us in the way of trial. We will win. We will win with love and love for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Love. Love for unbelievers is the bridge over which the gospel can cross. Are you listening? You see, that's the whole point of that tent revival we've got going on for the next two weeks. Is we're trying to build a bridge with love to a lost world. Trying to reach them for Jesus. Because you know what? I believe the Lord's coming back. He's very coming back very soon. And when he comes back, he's going to take that what? He's going to take that love with him. And that's all it's going. That's right. You get me? When Jesus comes back, all he's going to get is love. That's what he's taking back with him. There's nothing else going with him. It's love. And I want to know this morning, are you in that love? Do you have that love? If not, I'll tell you what. Come to the altar. Open your heart to Jesus. And he'll fill it full of love. Amen. Amen. Love. Love. Do you have it this morning? The devil don't want you to get it. But Jesus says it's free. He wants to fear you. He wants to love you. Why would you run from that? Amen. Why would you run from that? As we stand the same this morning. Let me ask you. If Jesus was to come today. Would you go in that love? Would you go in that love? If Jesus comes today. As we stand the same. What do we sing this week? Hymn number 480. 480. This altar is open for whatever you need. Maybe you want to join the church. Whatever it is. But if you're lost, I beg you.
week. Do you love the Lord? Amen. 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 Listen, Christian friend, love. Love is our biggest calling. Love is what God demands. Love is what we need to be sure. The world is wrong. Amen. Amen. Anybody have anything they'd like to share before we get started? Anybody? Else?